sorry for that mispronunciation. Uh, and uh, this morning we're, we're talking, we have a number of, we have quite a few uh, oral abstracts that are talking about all different aspects of, of cost. And uh, cost to the patient, cost to the health system. It's something that in the new uh, NTD strategy, there's really, uh, for the first time, a focus on the impact of, 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 of costs to, to people who need uh, screening for TB, people who, who are on treatment. Uh, WHO is launching a series, and you'll hear an, uh, about a, a number of them, I think, uh, of patient cost surveys. And so it's, it's, it's a new field, and, and um, we're, we're quite excited to, to hear uh, a lot about all of, uh, uh, quite a few of uh, the new studies and, and thinking around, um, around costs for, for people who have uh, TB. So uh, I'll pass it to Carol to uh, introduce the, the speakers. I think they're, they're short presentations. What we would like to do is have, we have the first four speakers up uh, on the stage and they will present. And then if there's uh, questions for the first four speakers, we will um, we'll take a few questions and then we'll invite the next uh, four speakers up to the stage and do the same uh, thing. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, my name is Carol Marini Nirenda. I'm from Sitan Plus uh, from uh, Zambia. So like Jacob uh, said, I'm co-chairing with him. So our first speaker is uh, Deborah Pedrazoli, and she is a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Her primary research interest is in the socioeconomic, uh, in the socioeconomic epidemiology of TB and in evaluating interventions to address TB and social inequalities. And uh, I think she'll be uh, sharing with us findings from a nationwide TB patient cost survey in Ghana. Deborah. Thank you, Carol. Good morning, everyone. So we are starting a session from West Africa and in Ghana, as Carol said. So as Jacob mentioned, the NTB strategy includes a new target of having a zero TB affected family facing catastrophic costs due to TB. In order to monitor progress towards this milestone, the WHO has recently developed a tool that countries are expected to adapt and to use to conduct survey uh, to monitor progress towards this target and to assess the occurrence of catastrophic costs in their settings. So we adapted the tool in Ghana and we conducted a cross-sectional nationally representative survey amongst patients on treatment facilities with the NTP network. Just a quick, three quick points about the survey setting that I would like to make. The first one is that despite positive economic growth for the past two decades, Ghana is still characterized by a quarter of its population living below the poverty line and by striking inequalities. The second thing I would like to the second point I would like to highlight is the TB situation in the country. So we had the impression that Ghana was doing quite well at controlling its TB epidemic, but a prevalence survey that was conducted in 2013 found out that the burden of disease is in fact three times higher than we previously thought. And the survey also highlighted that there are high uh, barriers to accessing and adhering to TB care. In Ghana, TB care, uh, TB care is meant to be free for all, with the exception of chest radiography, which is about um, $8 per chest X-ray. And lastly, Ghana is a, is a lower middle income country with a well, reasonably well developed social protection floor. And here again, three things I'd like to point out that are relevant for TB patients. So the first one is the National Health Insurance Scheme that was launched a few years ago and covers like about uh, a, um, a third of the Ghanaian population, but only people are enrolled in a formal sector of the economy. The second thing is the neighbors package that was launched again in 2003, and this is specific for TB patients, so, but it's been like, it's been currently being phased out. And lastly, the livelihood empowerment um, against poverty social protection scheme, which was launched as part of the National Social Protection Strategy in 2007, and is aimed at the rural poor. 
Right, so some preliminary findings. Sorry. So we had a total of 691 eligible patients in our study. And sorry, and it, just a quick thing. The data collection took place in November and December last year. And we, met, we enrolled 691 patients in the study. Um, sensitive TB patients experienced, uh, incurred about $850 per their TB episodes, while drug resistant uh, TB patients incurred double this amount, actually more than double this amount. Indirect costs accounted for the larger proportion of these costs. You can see the, the light blue uh, share of, the, of these donuts, and followed by expenses on food and on medical costs. So at a threshold of 20% of annual household income, which is the current um, threshold recommended by the WHO, more than um, two-thirds of patients in our sample experience catastrophic health expenditure due to the RTB. And in, in addition, 14% of patients were pushed below, below the poverty line due to TB. We also collected data on whether on receipt of social protection during our study. And we can see this like catastrophic health expenditure happening, despite the fact that patients, for example, 80% of our patients were enrolled in national health insurance schemes, so they were supposed to have free access to TB care. And a small proportion of them, just over a quarter, are still receiving the enablers package in the forms of like goods or vouchers of any kind, and especially receiving food support, like flour and supplements from the clinics. So, in conclusion, I think our findings show that uh, despite the fact that TB care is supposed to be free in Ghana, patients are still experiencing catastrophic health expenditures due to their disease. And the current social protection policies, like for example the National Health Insurance Scheme, are clearly not effective in preventing these catastrophic expenditures. So really what we, we, try to, we should try and do, like looking at the findings from the survey, is to then try and develop policies and identify entry points to try and, and mitigate these costs. So averting, trying to avert catastrophe and uh, alleviating the impoverishing effect of the disease. Thank you, and I would like to acknowledge the collaborators um, of the studies and whoever contributed to this piece of work. Thank you very much, Deborah. Uh, we'll take, as I said, questions at the end, but I, I think it's, it, it, it's nice. The, these, these surveys that are just uh, beginning to come out are allowing us to really highlight uh, the major impact that, that as, as Deborah said, free treatment is, is having on, on patients. And, and I think that is the, the first step towards moving towards the, the zero catastrophic cost that, that we uh, have envisioned as a, as a community for. Uh, for, for people who have TB. Early questions that, that hopefully uh, a number of others will, will take up. So it's, it's nice to see that uh, more, more in-depth thinking about how this is, is, is going to work in the future. You want to introduce them? Okay, thank you. Our next presenters were supposed to have been from Brazil, but actually they sent me an email to say I should pass their apologies to say the NTP and team are from Brazil were not uh, able to attend and they passed their apologies. And uh, I think the next presenter is Alexandra Katsaga, and he is a health policy financing and uh, health information system expert with extensive practical experience uh, globally. He is also involved in the development of the TB DRG system in Kazakhstan and Ukraine. He has uh, also developed m and systems for evaluating the effectiveness of provider payment for methods and their effect, uh, influence on healthcare providers. And uh, he'll, be looking, uh, he'll be looking at analyzing clinical and cost data for effective use of domestic resources for TB and he will be giving us the case of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, it's very difficult to provide all details and uh, say story within six slides and six minutes, but I will try. Um, uh, first slide, please. Uh, 
Um, are, are the slides? No slides. Okay. So some technical difficulties. Uh, so I will start from a short uh, description of how it uh, was started. Recently, Ukraine uh, started very radical reform in health financing system because all system was very inefficient and all hospitals around the country were paid by line items uh, according to number of beds, number of buildings. So, and uh, use this Apologies, we just want to start out the slide, yeah, this on. presentation. Mm -hmm. We can connect. So, that's it. This, this will not work. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, because of uh, all uh, practice to use line item uh, budget for healthcare providers, the hospital infrastructure in the country very massive and very outdated. And uh, the government started health financing reform to introduce strategic health purchasing in general healthcare system. Uh, from my experience in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, usually TB always outside of this movement. But uh, in Ukraine, we decided to propose, uh, together with Global Fund and WHO experts, uh, the similar approach for TB services, strategic health purchasing approach. Uh, the main reason is that in country, a very, very huge hospital infrastructure for TB services. You can imagine it's around 21,000 TB beds in the hospitals. It's around 10% of all beds in the country. And around 280 specialized TB facilities. So, and when we conduct some analysis, we realize that around 40% of all hospitalization can, it's really avoidable hospitalization, which can be treated outside of uh, TB facilities. Uh, TB is still vertical system outside of general health financing reforms. So, uh, during this uh, project, um, we propose to better match payment to TB priority services from building to people and introduce something like new payment mechanism, very similar with DRG uh, system. Uh, another aspect of the project is use data for decision monitoring and action, not just for reporting and for data collection, and create effective uh, process and policy dialogue on all level. We started from creation, creating, uh, creating patient database and within about 50 TB hospitals in country, all patients for the last three years was um, entered into database with clinical characteristic of case and characteristic of um, patient. Next uh, step, um, we created patient classification uh, system. According to this classification, each patient can be classified in particular cl clinical groups, clinical diagnostical groups which different um, by uh, first, um, first classification is TB and not TB cases. Then within TB cases, uh, classification pulmonary and extra pulmonary TB. Then bacteriological conform and clinical diagnosed. Then drug resistance category and then some uh, comorbidities uh, which shows the clinical uh, characteristic of the cases. After this uh, clinical hierarchy, all patients in database were classified in uh, particular clinical groups, which vary different by cost and length of stay and other characteristics. 
when we analyzed a database, we realized that around 41% of cases in TB hospitals are really, really not TB. It can be carriers and can be uh, some contact person with TB patient. And those patients, uh, patients was just put it to TB hospitals just to provide diagnostical services and stay in the hospitals within two or three weeks just to keep beds busy. And you can see this graph. And um, blue, uh, uh, it's uh, yellow, uh, uh, yellow is uh, now length of stay. Blue number of cases, and we can see when number of cases became became lower because of season, length of stay increased immediately. So very direct correlation. We can see clear that the hospitals trying to keep beds busy, and if it's less patients in the hospitals, the length of stay increased dramatically. They keep uh, those patients who in the hospitals um, a few more days. And uh, it's very uh, powerful analysis with multiple hospitalization. Here, timeline and uh, episode, or each episode of hospitalization, different colors, a different level of drug resistance. Each new episode hospitalization for uh, each patient provide new level of drug resistance, from monodrug resistance to extra polydrug resistance. So, and we can see clear picture that intensive hospital infrastructure provide patients with um, uh, more, uh, more complicated cases with uh, high level of drug resistance. And uh, after costing study, we realize that cost of the same patient, like for example, pulmonary sensitive TB in different hospitals can be different in three or four times, depends on uh, uh, just size of infrastructure, not depends on clinical or economical reason. And after that, we created um, a simu simulation model for TB optimization in the country, just to uh, see what can be done with this infrastructure. We can see here uh, number of bed days, number of admission and budget for TB hospitals in the system and the number of admission and bed occupancy rate in four hospitals in one region. And we realize the system when managers can exclude from hospitalization not TB cases, then provide length of stay, uh, not according to real situation, but according to international protocols. And we see that number of bed days, number of admission and potential budget savings, savings can be very, very huge. And the question is, uh, do we really need four hospitals in this region or it's enough just one? And if we can reallocate savings from hospital sector to um, ambulatory sector in, in the country. After this analysis, a lot of regions started real reform in health uh, NTB infrastructure and close physically a lot of uh, TB facilities which, is, which are really not necessary and reforms started in real practice because powerful information and uh, analytics provide good base, basis for decision making and for policy and decision and uh, uh, approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Muy buenos dias con todos. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about a uh, feedback from uh, Peruvian TB-affected households uh, after a socioeconomic event intervention. And the work that I'm presenting is on behalf of this wonderful innovation for health and development multidisciplinary team uh, headed by Marco Tovar and Carlton Evans out in Peru. So we've known for about 150 years or more, and Verkhoff recognised it 150 years ago, that TB is a social disease. And 100 years ago in the UK with the Papworth Village Settlement, we tried to deal with that by providing TB-affected households with uh, employment, with good nutrition and regular health checks. And that actually led to decreased rates of secondary active TB disease in children of those households. So 100 years on, we, our group was, was um, um, awarded a grant to conduct this community randomised evaluation of socio-economic intervention 
to prevent TB. And this was preceded by a household randomised study which I'm going to talk to you about today. So the study site is in Lima, it's actually specifically in Kayawa, 32 shantytown communities, covers a, about a million people in population, does have a, a, a level of poverty there, and some pockets of, of gun crime and drug addiction. What did we want to do with the kind of greater aims of the study? We wanted to find, prevent, cure, and control TB. And how to do those things? Well, you need to screen contacts for TB infection and disease. Those contacts who have infection need to start and, and complete preventive therapy. And the patients who have TB ideally should adhere to their treatment and complete the treatment for, for cure. But apart from all of that, we also want to educate, inform, and reduce stigma for those households. So we randomised 282 households, 135 of which received this socioeconomic support intervention. So the social support consisted of household visits, which were educational, health post visits, which were the same, and community meetings, which had two parts, a workshop about TB, its transmission, uh, um, how to, how to get, gain cure, uh, and also mutual support groups to try and reduce stigma and empower uh, TB-affected households. The economic support on the right side was provided by conditional cash transfers throughout uh, treatment for all of the things you see in the green boxes, including uh, engaging with the social support side of the intervention. And they totaled 230 uh, US dollars, which was 10% of annual income of TB affected households in our area. So the initial findings were that we increased preventive therapy initiation in contacts, we increased treatment success in patients, and we decreased catastrophic costs in households. But what was the feedback from the participants on the acceptability of the social and economic elements of the intervention? Probably one of the most important parts of the results. And did this vary by poverty level? To answer that question, we performed a mixed methods questionnaire at final follow-up, so usually at about six months of treatment. And we asked participants to rate the intervention, so excellent, good, neither good nor bad, bad, awful, um, and rank them, so highest rank of which of those elements, uh, which I'll show you there, uh, they preferred. So the social elements were divided into information and education and mutual support, and the economic elements were divided into incentivization, enablement, and poverty reduction. Now, obviously, incentivization, that could fit both groups, which, uh, but, but we put that, uh, in this case, in economic element. So what did people say overall? So this is the proportion of respondents who said in the darker parts of those, uh, um, those columns, so the, the bottom two dark parts uh, of those columns, it was good or excellent. So you see from left to right, we've got the information and education, mutual support, which together are the social elements, and then we've got incentivizing, enabling, and poverty reduction. And I think what you'll note overall is that over 80% said that they're good or excellent, uh, except for poverty reduction, which still had really overall good acceptability, but a bit lower than the others, at about 70% rated as good or excellent. This is slightly busy, but when we split things by, by poverty level, this is now ranking, so this is not good or excellent. This is which of all those elements did you value most within the, um, within the intervention? Uh, the top p-value there shows the comparison of social elements grouped together versus economic elements of the intervention. So the, the left two uh, columns versus the right three columns. And the uh, other p-values are really comparing the lighter grey bars, which are the poorer households, versus the darker grey bars, which are the less poor households. So overall, we can see that the economic elements were actually ranked lower in importance by the households and the social elements. And specifically, if you just look at the right-hand two columns, the reducing poverty section, there is a significant difference between the poorer households who ranked the reducing poverty uh, part of our intervention as lower than the less poor households. So overall, the intervention was acceptable to TB-affected households. The social elements had good feedback regardless of poverty level. And the economic elements were ranked lower than the social, especially in the poorer households and especially in, with regards to poverty reduction. 
So I think we need to consider whether or not we should be targeting perhaps enhanced support for the, for the most impoverished or other groups, for example, those with multi-drug resistance. But I also think in this wider conversation about catastrophic costs, we need to realize that this type of intervention it is not really a poverty reduction intervention. It is mitigating costs, yes, but the situation that people live in, it, it, it remains the same. So it's not really a poverty reduction intervention, but it hopefully might stop people going further into poverty. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tom. I think uh, the work that, that Tom and, and the, especially the, the team in, in, at Prisma in, in, in Peru and, and others in, in Latin America is really at the forefront of a, a different perspective from a, a lower burden country and, and certainly the issue of, of payments and, and incentives are, uh, are, are something that is, is always uh, uh, an issue to be uh, evaluated with a nice uh, evaluation of that. So we have a few minutes. If there are specific questions, we'd ask you to come up to the microphone for these presenters. Does anyone have any, any questions? OK. Um, so thank you very much uh, to all of you. And um, could we ask the, f the next four uh, presenters to to come up. I don't know, Carol, if you want to have their names in order. Yeah. I think we, we have Nadia, Juliet, um, is it Famieta? is uh, Juliet, um, who is an assistant a professor of global health in the Global Health Institute at the University of Georgia. She is a Ugandan physician trained in public health and uh, health service research. Her research primarily focuses on active case finding to enhance earlier detection of infectious cases of TB and TB HIV co-infection persons in Africa and also evaluation, evaluating cost effectiveness of case finding strategies. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak uh, at this conference. Uh, my talk is going to be uh, on cost effectiveness of pulmonary uh, TB case finding among uh, high-risk communities in Kampala. Where do you move? Is this the thing that moves? Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. I went up. Okay. So we all know that passive case finding is uh, a strategy that uh, by and large has been uh, documented to uh, detect at least an estimated num uh, percentage of uh, cases, which is about 60% uh, in most regions, most countries. But as we see this, uh, we know that about 40% of the cases remain undetected. So what, what this means is that these 40% or even some, in some cases even 50% of the cases that remain undetected really are the ones that are perpetuating uh, the transmission uh, of TB in communities, especially in high burden countries. So active case finding has already been shown as one of the uh, strategies that can be employed to detect those un undetected cases. And when I talk about active case finding, I'm really talking a broad, uh, about a broad range of approaches that are used to find those undetected cases. For example, household contact investigations where you would identify an index case at the clinic and then follow them up to their households and then screen the entire household because these are high risk. And then there's also the enhanced uh, case finding, which uh, primarily is a more proactive uh, co-health worker driven efforts to try to get the uh, cases or at least patients who are 
presumptive of TB to come to the healthcare facilities using various methods and people have used different approaches such as race uh, uh, awareness and educational uh, materials, educational flyers, uh, using mass media. So there's a whole broad range of, of methods that can be employed to achieve enhanced, uh, enhanced, uh, enhanced case finding. So we know that these methods of active case finding have been shown to be effective in detecting additional cases. However, what we don't know or where we have very limited evidence is on the cost effectiveness. And that has almost been a huge bottleneck for people adapting, especially you know, national TB programs. They know that yes, active case finding works, but then when it comes to the cost effectiveness aspect, there's always a, a gap in knowledge. And so that has caused uh, programs not to adapt the case finding, active case finding methods. So we conducted a study to evaluate the average cost of detecting a TB case using the standard uh, passive case finding uh, compared to a combination of strategies. And then we also wanted to evaluate the cost effectiveness of combining passive case finding, enhanced case finding, and household contact investigation and compare it to doing passive case finding alone. So very quickly through the methods, we um, used a study population that was around, especially slum areas. We engaged uh, different populations around uh, slums in Kampala. And this is what we define as high risk, just because of the nature of the crowding and the nature of uh, the access to care and many other things that are going on between January and December uh, 2015. And the study inputs were probabilities, cost data, uh, generated from either programs or projects that we're doing enhanced our active case finding or even the national TB program data from the health facilities that are serving within those settings, within those communities that we designated as our study population. And then we also wanted to know what the yield of TB cases would be from all these range of approaches. And then the perspective that we chose to take was the health provider perspective, recognizing that this is limited, but this was of most interest to the national TB programs because they are really interested in what does it cost them. Obviously, the most ideal way to approach this would have been the societal perspective, which incorporates the, care, you know, the, the caregiver costs and the patient costs, which is very important even now as we speak about catastrophic costs to, to the patients. But this is outside the scope of, of the interest of this study, um, and so I won't present that part. And then we did a, an ingredient-based approach to costing, which looks at st includes staff sal salaries, includes lab tests, travel to go to the households when we do contact investigations, and also um, um, uh, the, the awareness type of campaigns which lead to the enhancement of, of case finding. And then the effectiveness measure is the, uh, included the number of bacteriological, bacteriologically confirmed TB cases identified. And our cost, uh, our outcome is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides. So we used a decision analytic model to try to come up with what we would expect. And so those, uh, the decision model really is just a way of structuring different options that you would want to compare, so to speak. These are the competing type of strategies that you're really wanting to, to select which one is the most optimal over, let's say, the standard of care. So in our case, the standard of care, of course, is the passive case finding, and we wanted to compare it to the combination, which has the three strategies, doing passive case finding on top of, uh, um, and on top of that, add uh, enhanced case finding and ha add household contact investigation. And so what you see here is really just the model that shows you the pathway, a potential pathway that a patient would take. So to, on, on the top, you can see that uh, once a patient enters care, they, if they take the passive case finding alone route, then that means, um, it would mean that, sorry. So they would go up that route, and then they would go through a, a, a different series of uh, evaluations, whether they have chronic cough, uh, two weeks or more, and then they would either be diagnosed by uh, sputum microscopy or could be diagnosed by gene expert. And all those, at this point, you're really tracking the patient through a, a process or a pathway until they reach the end point, which is the detection. And all along, they are really picking up costs on the health provider side. And that would be the same if they went, uh, they were detected through this route. 
So this is what basically uh, this uh, model shows us. But at the end, we really want to generate the expected values in costs and effectiveness, which is the yield of TB cases. And this helps us to get an, an idea of what, what, would, what would it cost, what would be the average number if we repeated this uh, process many, many times. That is basically what the expected value would tell us. So for our results, we found that generally the yield of active case finding over uh, this one year period uh, was about 4,750 uh, 4, cases from passive case finding after uh, screening about 12,000 uh, 12, presumptive cases. And then when you combined uh, the, the whole range of uh, the whole range of um, uh, 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 combinations of, of, of strategies, then you would uh, be able to detect about um, uh, 5,000 uh, cases. And then the average cost for PCF alone was about uh, $900 compared to about $4,000, or uh, let's say $4,900 for the combination. So for the incremental cost effectiveness uh, analysis, which is really trying to tell the policymaker if you did passive case finding alone compared to uh, doing the combination of the three strategies, how much would that cost you to detect that additional case that you're trying to look for? That, this is what this result show, shows you. So I'll just quickly walk you through the key numbers in this table because I, I purpose to not take too much time again because of the limited uh, time that we are given as speakers. But what I highlight here is, as you can see, um, uh, this first... Do you see the point? Okay, good. So this effectiveness number is really telling you that expected value. So if you, uh, if you screened people through this uh, passive case finding alone, you would expect, after spending this amount of money, you would detect uh, roughly you know, 10 cases, let's say 11 cases. But if you compared that to the combination here, this is what you would uh, end up spending, and then you would uh, uh, detect, or this would be the yield or the effectiveness, about 24 cases. But the number that is really important here is the ISA, or the incremental cost effectiveness uh, ratio, which is about 8,200 over there, which really tells us that to, 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 to detect that additional case when you're doing okay, um, with with the, the new targets and, and global plan, it's very clear that we, we, and as you rightly said, we're missing huge proportions in Uganda. The new prevalence survey results come out, and we know many people with TB are missed, and, and these kind of analysis really help to think about what the best ways uh, of finding them are. So thank you very much for that. Um, so our next presenter is Nadia Bikelov who is a doctor in health economics, and she has a PhD in economic evaluation of health technology. She has also worked for the French uh, Ministry of Home Affairs and also WHO in Geneva, as well as the epicenter in France. So, um, good morning, everybody, and thank you to giving me a chance to speak today. Um, next. So, um, the objective of this presentation today is to present you uh, the result of the cost effectiveness evaluation of introducing the tubulin test into the diagnostic algorithm of HIV patients with symptom of TB in Omabe, Kenya. The determined TB test is a TB urinary lateral flow assay for HIV patients that does not require equipment, infrastructure, give us fast results, and can be used for HIV patients who are not able to produce sputum. So, however, um, the cost effectiveness evaluation are important to help decision maker and to guarantee efficiency in decisions. In our study, we compared three preliminary TB diagnostic algorithms. The first one, the conventional, with um, clinical exam and radiological exam. The second one, with a clinical exam, radiological exam, plus a lamp test, and the third one was a clinical radiological exam plus a lamp test and expert test. 
For the cost evaluation, we took the health service perspective and we used the micro costing method or in the ingredient based method. It means that all the sources were evaluated. And for the outcomes, we took the number of screening on treated cases. Then, cost and effectiveness of algorithm two and three were compared with the conventional algorithm and we calculated the cost effectiveness ratio and the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And as the study was more than one year, we applied a 4% discount rate for both cost and effectiveness. And finally, we compared ICR to a stress of value of 2,580 euro, euro, sorry, which is the two time uh, Kenyan GDP in 2000, 2013. So the result, 474% were included in the study. I don't know if it's more. Okay. So it, as you can see in the table, when we introduce only the land test, the total cost increased by approximately 2,300 euro. And when we introduced the land and export test, the total cost uh, increased by 3,400 uh, 3, uh, 3, euro. And it results in increase of the mean cost per algorithm by respectively 5 euro and 7 euro. And regarding our key spending, the cost effectiveness ratio was more advantageous for the clinical radiological LAM expert algorithm compared to the conventional algorithm. This one. We can see that uh, this algorithm will reduce uh, the, the cost effectiveness ratio by 170 uh, euro. And when you, we see the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, we can see that for the clinical radiological lab algorithm, it was 114 euros. And 131 euros for the clinical radiological LAM expert algorithm. And also, you can see that the difference between the two algorithms was not used, only 18 euros. We also performed sensitivity analysis. The first one was about the discount rate, and the second one was about the variation of the genus per cartridge price. And the sensitivity analysis didn't change any results. In conclusion, we can say that the introduction of the TBM test doesn't represent an excessive cost, and algorithm including one plus expert was highly cost effective to diagnose TB for HIV positive patients. Uh, new diagnostics uh, that, that are not expert, I think, are, are sometimes struggling to uh, to gain some traction in, in, in many countries, so it's 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 nice to see some some analysis of um, of, of how they work. Can I go on to the next? Yeah, we have Sophia Hadid, uh, who is a, a PhD student in epidemiology at the McGill International TB Center. Uh, Sophia works uh, on diagnostics and patient mortality in the Indian TB epidemic. So I apologize, I've more or less completely lost my voice, so we're going to keep this short and sweet. And today I'm going to do my best to uh, describe to you a cost analysis and the health systems perspective of a uh, upfront and expert testing of pediatric presumptive TB patients in India. Between uh, April 2014 and June 2016, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics uh, provided free upfront expert testing of pediatric presumptive TB patients referred from either the public or private sector in Delhi, Hyderabad, Chennai, and Kolkata. Through the two years of this experiment, they tested a rather astonishing 42,000 patients with 46,000 expert tests. 
the objectives for this cost analysis were to provide updated expert protest unit costs, in which we performed in a bottom-up approach, and uh, provide costs for demand generation outreach activities, which were costed from the top down, and finally to explore the, the cost dynamics of these de demand generation costs and the cost per patient referral. So this is your fairly standard uh, unit cost per batch size for the daily laboratory, as one would expect. If you only use your expert machine once per day, that's quite expensive at about $32. If you run 16 tests, which is the maximum you can run in an eight hour workday, you've dropped down to 13 tests, $13.40. What was unique about our analysis was that for each of our four laboratories, for each day the laboratory was operational, we had exact numbers of expert tests performed. So for each day, for each lab, we could place the number of expert tests performed along this curve and provide the most accurate batch size cost for the expert tests for those days. Using those workload adjusted numbers, we calculated the workload adjusted average protest unit cost for experts for each of our four laboratories. Those are the numbers shown in parentheses here. These figures show in black uh, the quarterly volume of tests performed, and in red the theoretical capacity if you'd run the full 16 tests for each expert machine every day. And you can see that for cities like Delhi and Hyderabad that were close or in some cases exceeding their theoretical aid or capacity, this, was, uh, this here reflects over time conducted in the Delhi lab, the average per unit cost when adjusted for workload is slightly lower than in Kolkata and Chennai where uh, the, capac the full capacity really wasn't utilized. Uh, these, the difference of, between these average numbers and the $13.40 shown here, the theoretically most efficient expert price, is a measure of the inefficiencies and in unused capacity in these laboratories. Uh, I'd also like to point out that the workload did increase over time, which is a good sign. It shows that, hope, suggests that the outreach activities were effective in encouraging patient referrals from physicians. We also costed the three types of outreach activities that were conducted by FIND to uh, promote the project to physicians and make them aware that they could refer presumptive pediatric patients for free expert testing. Phone calls, we costed at 16 cents per call. One-on-one -on -one meetings with physicians were $7.14 per meeting. And continuing medical education workshops that promoted the project were an average of $7.88 per attendee. Across the cities, the average, the average numbers of these outreach activities conducted per quarter varied a, a little bit, uh, but the overall average spending per quarter was between 1100 USD in 2015 USD uh, and $1,900. Now, we may look at that but broken down by the uh, average number of referrals. You see that the cities that had higher volumes got a little more bang for their buck, and the cities that had lower uh, test volumes were spending more per patient referral. Finally, this figure uh, shows for combined for all cities, the average outreach cost per patient in the black line. Throughout the experiment, the average outreach cost was $1.24 per patient referral. But you see that when we break it down by quarter, the outreach cost decreases over time. This is encouraging, suggesting that the targeting of the outreach activities was more efficient as time went on, even while the number of patients shown here in the dotted line increased over time. Our main takeaway from this project is that we believe it's important whenever possible to look at the cost dynamics with these demand generation activities because it's the careful calibration of the supply and demand of these tests that will determine the long-term affordability and the sustainability of these projects as they transition to NTP control. And because he's here and I can embarrass him, I'd like to thank Hujun Sung and the rest of the fine team for their support of this project. Thanks so much. of TB control interventions in three steps. So first looking at the unconstrained um, cost effectiveness. So assuming that there are no constraints applying to the health system, then adding in the constraints to see what um, effect they have on outcomes and costs. And then the third steps would be to quantify in case there is a difference between the constrained coverage of the interventions and the unconstrained coverage, how much would it cost to relax these constraints? So what can these constraints be? 
we, as a proof of concept, decided to look at three potential health system constraints that we think affect interventions in South Africa. We based this on the literature and then we discussed this with uh, officials and stakeholders at the National Department of Health. So we looked at the financial constraint characterized as the TB budget, and then we looked at the direct constraints affecting access to services. So we decided to look at uh, availability of human resources to deliver TB services. And then lastly, we looked at a policy constraint that I'm going to explain to you in a minute, characterizes the maximum number of expert tests that can be performed in a year. And um, so the TB control interventions that we looked at are the ones that the Department of Health is considering for the new national TB plan that covers the period 2017 to 2021. And uh, our focus is, as I said, on facility-based case detection and to um, to calculate the outcomes under each intervention scenario, we, look, uh, we use the time transmission model. And um, then to the model outputs, we attach the cost per service, the unit cost per service, the minutes of nurse of staff time per service, and the number of experts to calculate the financial and human resource requirements under each intervention scenario. I'm not going to go through these in a lot of details, but just to say that the interventions that we looked at include the status quo, obviously, so the base case, and then we looked at two, two different screening algorithms, uh, one using the cough triage, so a single cough question um, asking patients whether they've been coughing for more than two weeks, and then the other screening algorithm was the full WHO symptom screener, which is a longer list of symptoms that are more specific to TB, and then we looked at combinations of these interventions together in two different populations either just the HIV clinic attendees or all primary healthcare patients. And then in terms of the constraint scenarios, we had um, three levels of uh, potential restrictions on the outputs based on what we thought would be the future availability of budget and of human resources. So we had a more restrictive constraint, a medium constraint scenario, and then a least restrictive scenario. And then for the policy constraints, so the number of expert tests, we um, characterize this as a multiplier on the number of tests that South Africa is willing to buy per um, notified case, because we know that when they budget, they cap this ratio as 20 tests per notified case. And this doesn't depend on the budget. It's just a political um, consideration of the viability of, um, of expert, basically, in the country. So the last bit of methods that I'm going to cover um, is how we went about estimating the available human resources minutes per year in South Africa and the cost of relaxing them. So we tried to use, well, we had to use um, routine data. So in terms of how many minutes are required to provide each TB service, we used um, data from the DHIS and then from available uh, trials measuring time use in TB service provision. And then for the cost of relaxing this constraint, so as, um, hiring more human resources, we calculated this um, from routine data from the South African Nursing Council, and uh, we assumed that some minutes could be generated from nurses that already operate in the health sector, but in the private sector in South Africa, and then additional minutes had to be procured by hiring and training new nurses. Okay, so what we found very quickly, um, I hope you can see that. Um, so this figure shows the human resource requirement for each service under the base case, so assuming that no uh, new interventions are introduced. And it shows how the most demanding TB services in terms of nurse time are case finding, particularly when we use a WHO symptom screener because it takes longer to administer, and then followed by first-line treatment and then isoniazid preventive therapy for HIV-infected patients. And here, um, we compare the financial resource requirement under the expert constraint and the high and medium human resource constraints to the unconstrained scenario. So the expert constraint restricts the coverage of all interventions, including the base case, potentially. So case finding interventions, number six to 10 in the graph, are the most impacted by a cap on the number of expert tests. And this is obviously a result of the fact that we expect larger numbers um, in need of tests testing when we adopt screening strategies that have a higher yield. Whereas the human resource constraint, on the other hand, only restricts the use of the WHO symptom screener because that's the most human resource intensive, so intervention seven, to eight, uh, seven eight, and 10 in the graph. 
And lastly, um, here we're showing the additional nurse minutes needed to achieve the unconstrained intervention coverage. So how many of those minutes are already available in the private health sector and the total costs of providing additional minutes that are not currently available. And we showed it, we showed a split between salary costs and training costs. So there are only two scenarios where the additional human resources can be sourced from the private sector, and they both involve the less human resource intensive cough triage. Um, the most costly scenario involves reaching full coverage of the WHO symptom screener among all primary healthcare patients. Um, and the cost of hiring and training a sufficient number of nurses in this scenario between 2017 and 2035 are approximately 3.7 billion US dollars, which corresponds to about 70% of the current budget for TB in South Africa. So that would be a 70% increase on the current expenditure. So in conclusion, um, we um, tried to show with this piece of work that locally relevant routine data, the literature and ongoing studies and expert opinion can all be used to try and empirically estimate the um, health system constraints that apply in a real world setting and how much it would cost to relax them. So the most limiting constraint we found to be human resources and policy decision rather than actual budget. So money doesn't seem to be an issue as much as other health system constraints. So to achieve the full coverage of the most human resource intensive case finding interventions would require up to 15% of all human resources currently working in South Africa to be reallocated to TB. And hiring and paying these additional nurses to deliver these interventions requires a budget increase of approximately 70% compared to current expenditure. So um, one, li one limitation of what we tried to do is that data quality and availability are a potential limitation to the approach that we used. Um, and the next step would be to try and figure out which TB screening interventions would be cost effective if placed in the real world setting of South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think uh, looking at how specific interventions uh, might work. I, I have uh, one question, uh, actually, and, and if others, please uh, come up for, for, for questions. Uh, but if you could talk a little uh, bit about, in many, many countries, um, these kind of screening approaches are done not by nurses, but by uh, lay workers or um, even janitorial staff, which obviously have far lower costs than uh, having a nurse spend that time to do it. So I was wondering if you, if you looked into that at all in, in terms of task shifting and, and allowing something that probably nurses don't need to do to, um, to, to lower potential costs. Um, yes, thanks. We did um, we did get costs for um, task shifting, so for using uh, for using community health workers instead of nurses. We did not present that because that currently is not an option in South Africa. Because although it would be cheaper in terms of the unit cost of providing the service, because um, they are not routinely used um, community health workers in South Africa, they would need to be trained and employed across the board, basically across the whole health system and that's a huge upfront cost so basically we're not really sure that in South Africa that would be the cheaper option currently because human resource um, because community health workers are not used in the South African health system at the moment but it would definitely be a good solution in other settings potentially thank you Ojun, do you want to hello okay Hi, uh, Ho Jun Song from Johns Hopkins, and thanks for great presentations. Uh, it's great to see all these uh, health economic evaluations going up, lots of variety of uh, interest going on there. Uh, my questions are for the first two presenters and also some comments after that. Um, so primarily, I wanted to see uh, your primary outcomes are all evaluated in terms of number of additional cases diagnosed and your conclusions are all based on that. Now, uh, my understanding of co being cost effective, where you compare to GNI or GDP per capita, it's usually, and this, this criteria has been, uh, you know, uh, no longer it applies anymore based on the WHO. And that's based on how um, each program evaluates itself. But 
Previously, it's been uh, against, weighed against the DALIs, the co incremental cost effectiveness ratio, where effectiveness measurements are based on DALIs there. If you project that towards in terms of number of DALIs averted, then the cost effectiveness ratio may go down from, from $8,000 or in years, uh, maybe a lot lower than that. So I wanted to make a quick comment about that, but ask you, when you include costs, do you include costs beyond diagnostics, so including cost of treatment, um, and whether or not how that factors in in your models? Um, and then secondly, the question is, um, the models, whether or not you, in the active case finding components, do you incorporate any kind of patients potentially coming back in the system in the passive case finding? Because previously, for in my, um, my modeling exercise, so when you, even if you build a cost effectiveness model, you have to target your, you have to adjust your model so that your projection for passive case finding matches the passive fi case finding levels that are provided or reported in the general uh, consensus. So based on your initial finding in the Uganda, it seems like it's 38% that from your model results, that's much, much lower than uh, what's been kind of reported where you said in the, in the introduction about 60%. So I wanted to kind of raise those questions and yeah. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> pretty long, but I, I'll just take a shot at it. And uh, you do raise very, very legitimate questions. And I, as I highlighted at the beginning, these are only the very beginnings of beginning to even do the cost effectiveness analysis. Yeah. Yes, we would like to do a more comprehensive job, uh, including uh, using delis or even qualies as, as the outcomes of interest, yeah. but more I would say, one, uh, most of these cost effectiveness analyses are driven by what's most important right now, especially for programs. A program manager or policy makers, yes, they would appreciate knowing the dailies and the qualities, but more importantly, the targets that they focus on are the cases that they detect. So we kind of want to be able to do studies that align with the interest of what would drive the decisions that they would make at a programmatic level. Yeah. So that would be one. But of course, this in, in some ways underestimates the impact of some of the strategies that we are looking at. For instance, if you're looking at active case finding and household contact investigations, we would much like to add the future cases that are averted because the active case finding effect does not only end at detecting the case, but you've really prevented some cases and that probably that has a much greater weight in, in the grand scheme of things because we are really trying to eliminate TB. So in, in thinking and in agreement with what your comments are, we definitely need to do more comprehensive cost effectiveness analysis, include the more long-term future uh, sort of uh, outcomes that would be able to capture the, the entire picture. Okay, I hope that uh, answers uh, somewhat. Yeah, um, no, just to piggyback on that, I don't know right. if you have time, and I'm not, I don't, certainly don't want to hold the microphone, but to comment on that, I think it's important to capture that metric. It's, especially it's important because it's a direct outcome. Right. Now, when you compare that to a cost effectiveness conclusion, I think you need to justify more than just saying that it's below GNI or GDP per capita because that comparison in previously, it was compared to the value metric and where you have used that to lead, you know, compare different types of interventions and you know, declare whether or not it's cost effective. I think when you compare co incremental cost uh, cases detected per cost or costs per case detected, then you have to justify that with other kind of resource constraints that's available. So when you say you, you have $8,000 to, uh, to invest per case detected, how does that translate into budget constraints and other things to make that case where it's cost effective for the program or cost not effective? Right. It's not simple comparison to the GD, GDP or GNI per capita. Right. That's just my comment. I agree. Just to add, I, I agree with you uh, totally, but if you want to know if uh, our intervention or our uh, is um, affordable for the country entire, uh, we have to make in deep analysis with the budget impact analysis. So, yes. Any, any
any final uh, questions? We do have a few minutes left, but okay, people are hungry for lunch. So um, I just want to say um, thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you to the, the speakers. It was really a, a wide range of, of topics, and, and clearly, I think it, these, these, this type of evaluation and studies are, are needed, more of them going forward. A number of presenters have pointed out the lack of, of information, so, so thank you very much. And, and also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Carol, the co-chair, uh, for helping organize this and, and maybe give her the last word. No, I just want to also just thank the, the presenters for coming to share the uh, presentations on the country experiences. Uh, it's, it's always good for people to listen to what's happening at country level. So to just say thank you, and also for everybody who's come on the last day to come and uh, um, listen to our presentation. Thank you.